your accent. That's all you need. Well, hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us this lovely Wednesday for another Facebook Live with Napa Valley Wine Academy. Really excited about today's uh, topic, a very bubbly topic indeed. I'll just tease it a little bit before I bring my two uh, guests on screen here. Um, as a reminder, we're here every Wednesday, 2 p.m. for study hall. So get ready to learn something. Uh, today is no exception. And instead of one guest, uh, we have a, two guests. So uh, bonus, bonus for you today. I'm going to bring onto uh, the screen uh, the lovely Catherine Bouguet from uh, Napa Valley Wine Academy, one of our uh, superstars and one of the co-founders of Napa Valley Wine Academy. You've brought along a special guest uh, today, Catherine. Who do you have? Who do you have for us? I sure did. Thank you so much, Christian. So today I'm very, very excited to have um, Jamario Vila on with us. And and Jamario, uh, you're going to love him by the end of this session. It only takes a minute. Um, but he's Italian born, um, LA based. He's a master taster. He has the equivalent of um, WSET diploma, but he presents for many different um, corporations and institutions, Getty Museum, UCLA Extension, um, Italian Cultural Institute. I, you know, I, I don't want to take up too much time, but his his bio is long and diverse. Um, he splits his time between California and Europe, um, and he is the U.S. ambassador for Francia Corta. So, of course, we're going to use the sparkling wines of um, DOCG Francia Corta to take through the WSET SAT today. Um, but super excited to have um, um, Jamario on with us. Jamario. Say I'm hi. excited here. I'm excited here. <laughs> Thank you for the beautiful presentation. Indeed, I am a fish who likes to swim in different waters. Uh, I learned that from my family. And uh, today I'm here as a brand ambassador for Francia Corta. It's, uh, it's, I know it sounds rhetorical, but it is a pleasure and an honor because we're talking about uh, um, fabulous wine and a wine region that made the history of Italy, not only in Italy, but also uh, around the world. And uh, uh, it's a tough job, but we will have to taste a few wines on your name. <laughs> and uh, we're going to share some information and open to answer questions and to spread the word of, of good wine, first of all, and then today, Francia Court, of course. I love it. Thank you so much, Jamario. Why don't we start off, before we dive into the SAT, why don't you tell us just a little bit about, um, you know, the region itself, you know, something oh, about... Sure, yeah. Uh, let, let, let's start by two things. Where are we and what is it? So we're talking, you, you can see from this beautiful picture, actually, when I had the chance to pick from the mini they sent me, uh, I picked this one because you see the Alps in the background, uh, the, the uh, Iseo, Lake. Uh, so we are in north of Italy, the deep north. We are right by Switzerland, so far away from the stereotypes of the sunny Mediterranean south or central, which I adore, by the way. We're talking about extreme condition, high altitude, bordering Switzerland, uh, literally a stone throw from Milan. Uh, a pretty small area, after all, 200 square kilometers about, uh, and a little over 3,000 hectares of vineyards. And we're going to talk later about this, but 62% are certified organic, which these days is pretty important to, to remember. Um, like I said, lake of glacier origin from the north, uh, the Olio River on the west side, and the northeast, uh, the Ration Alps. So as you know, it's a wide region, the Alpine region. Here we have the Ration ones and the town of Brescia in the south. Uh, Francia Corta, I, I would like to say, what does it mean, the etymology for a moment? Because it comes from Curte Franca. Curte Franca was free courts in terms of taxation. Back in the Middle Ages, there were areas where the Clunian monks from Burgundy and Cisternian monks from all around Italy arrived to start farming and agriculture and viticulture in particular. The best Osterias at that time were extension of the monasteries, okay, where they were selling wine and also hosting socially people. So that's the etymology. Uh, and, and today is um, actually under the umbrella Francia Corta, we have one word to identify three concepts. One is the land method. Francia Corta is strictly a barrel from a secondary fermentation. Uh, so it's a wine from secondary fermentation barrel. It's also a wine district. And is also a wine kind. So we we have three concepts already there in in one word. Now um, 
uh, I think it's it's good to remember that no matter what wine we talk about, but in particular from Jakarta, uh, we're talking about the influence of Mother Nature and the influence of the humankind. So uh, we can also justify the differences between uh, wines to wines, label to way labels, and district to district, despite the same production method or a similar production method. Uh, Francia Corte, in particular, benefit of a very peculiar micro and microclimate. Actually, I like to say wine come from three conditions, mostly meteorology, geography and geology, and history and culture, which is the human portion. Don't forget that we make wine to drink wine. It's a business, a big business today, but it's also a pleasure. So the style we make is what we want to drink is extremely important. That's the human effect. Uh, but, you know, we cannot forget about Mother Nature because the soil we have, the sun that goes around our head, the wind blowing, the mountains, you know, the terroir in terms of micro and the, and the surrounding in terms of macro are affecting to the point that no matter what you like, Mother Nature will always prevail. So it's not about what you want, it's about what she wants. So we're going to keep in mind uh, uh, the, the, the latitude, deep north, the altitude, the proximity to the Alps, the, the benefit from the lake that during summer can mitigate the temperature and during winter can spread some heat uh, by retaining the heat uh, from, the, from the, the, the surface of the water, uh, as well as the geography and the geology. Look at this beautiful photo. I mean, the, I, I insisted on keeping this photo because you can see from the snow and snow pretty much all the way through through March, uh, depending on the year. So we have a very cold climate. But as we were chatting, me and Catherine, a few days ago, the Lake of Iseo, which is maybe is not as famous as the Lake of Como, but it's a, it's a marvel of nature with a regional park. Uh, inside uh, um, can help during winter, helping the sugar uh, increasing slowly during the season and reach that ripeness that we need to, to produce the wine as we know. It's such a, spe a special area. I mean, to have, you know, to have the influences, like in the summertime when it starts to warm up, you still have that cool air coming down from, you know, the mountains. And then you have the mitigating factor of, of the large lake. I mean, just beautiful conditions for maintaining the acidity, you know, for making um, premium sparkling wine. You know, I always call, of course, French Corda Italy's best bubbles. Um, maybe I'm a little biased, but uh, <laughs> could you tell us, Jamario, a little bit about the great varieties we're going to see? In, in yes, um, uh, open and close parentheses, uh, let's not forget that the, the, what makes a good wine is uh, the grapes need to suffer. So we need cold, we need heat, we, we need temperature excursion, day and night, summer and winter. We need diversity of environment and climate. So we don't want a flat, uh, stable condition of the weather. So when we talk about the Alps, of course, that's the, 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 the best case scenario. In terms of grapes, we see some, some um, picture of grapes right here. Uh, Pinot Nero, we call it the Italian way, as well as Pinot Bianco. Chardonnay and Herba Mat, which is a, a novelty uh, in terms of production, not from the area. Herba Mat was already uh, is part of the viticulture since the Renaissance. And the very first mention was already about 500 years ago. But today is allowed up to 10%. But only the 2020 vintage will have Herba Mat in the actual wine because it's very recently introduced in the production methods. So this is breaking um, news for all of you out there, because it's just breaking news. 2020 breaking news. Um, that the Erbanat, Erbanat can exactly, be used. Exactly, exactly. And it's a late, a late ripener with strong acidity, so I think it fits very well in, in the blend, and the idea to keep low for now, so you can test the influence and the effect on the wine. It's a clever move from the Consortio di Gran Francia Corta, which today, by the way, is my, my saint and protector. I represent the consortium and I'm happy to do so today. Great. So let's, um, I say we talk about the three wines we're going to um, taste today. And so the yes. different styles, right? So why don't you take us through the three um, styles that we're going to be tasting today? Uh, absolutely. So first of all, let me give you a very quick preview on what a Francia Corte is. We can have a non-vintage Francia Corta with a Chardonnay, Pinot Nero, uh, Pinot Bianco, uh, up to 50% uh, um, of the blend, and Herba Mat up to 10%. Then we have uh, uh, Rosé, 
which is Pinot Nero up to 35, sorry, minimum to 35. And then we have Chardonnay, maximum 65, Pinot Bianco 50, and Herbama 10. And then we have Vintage and Reserva. Uh, and the differences are mostly the, the aging period on the lees, being a, a secondary ferment, fermentation of the bottle. That's, as we know all, it's the most delicate step, the kind of yeast we add, and the length, of course, and the bottle pressure and so so forth. So we go from the 18 months minimum of a non-vintage to the 24 of a satin. We're going to talk about satin in a moment. And then 30 months of a vintage and the 60 month of a reserva, which, by the way, in the panorama of the uh, metodo tradizional or metodo classico, it's very high as a minimum uh, aging period. I, I like to remind these are minimum. So it's, uh, it's also up to the winemaker to extend that period in in relation to the kind of wine they want to offer. Mm -hmm. Great. And before we pick up that first glass, um, I think it's interesting to know that, you know, uh, Francia Corta put regulations on themselves. The producers got together for their DOCG before they had the DOCG yes. um, certification. They got themselves together and put regulations on themselves saying, you know, we can produce premium, you know, sparkling wines here. And so they restricted themselves greatly uh, and they got that DOCG no problem because they had already, you know, said, we produce these premium wines. We're going to have these regulations so that our wine tastes like this and is this quality level. I just think that's amazing. Even before they had to um, restrict themselves, they did that on purpose because their sole goal, you know, again, was to be Italy's best bubbles. It's serious business. And like you said, when anticipate the law, uh, the legislator, it shows the care you have for your product, the ethic that you apply to your work, and also the goal that you want to achieve. In 1960, um, we had the first, uh, basically, Francia Corta, um, and, and in that case, we had Franco Zigliani as a leader, pioneer, but 67 is really the year of the DOC, and the 95, the year of the DOCG. But in between, there is a lot of work. And like you mentioned, all these producers are getting together, tasting, over tasting. And we talk about Satin, I have a beautiful story about this. All right, great. Well, why don't we start off, you know, with the tasting. I think some of our, um, you know, viewers are here today to say, hey, you know, let's take a sparkling wine through the WSCT. So I'll take it through the level three, but I'll give a few, you know, um, um, tips on level four as well um, for anybody out there. But of course, with our sparkling wine, we're going to do, um, we're using the same SAT card as you do for a still wine. And we are going to pretty much take it through the same exact you know levels that we do there's an added one of course because in the level three we'll be talking about mousse um but let's just start from the beginning when we talk about the appearance you know of a wine we're still talking the points lie with intensity and color and so just like for a still wine you're going to angle down your wine at 45 degree angle and you're looking for the saturation of color you know, between the core and the rim. So you're looking for, do you have a wide watery rim? Then you're going to be pale. If the color saturation goes up closer to the rim, then you're going to be medium. If your color saturation goes all the way up to the rim, then you're going to be deep. For this wine that I have here, this is a vintage 2009, where you're getting to a deeper concentration here, a deeper intensity. And so I'm seeing the saturation go up further towards the rim. We have a beautiful medium intensity here. Um, and it wouldn't be tough for you to see um, from home, but it is a nice medium intensity. When we go to the color, generally, oh, that's perfect. Thank you, Jamario. When we go to the color, we're generally choosing between lemon and gold, right? Gold is when you have some brown or orange, you know, to the color of the wine. So you're showing some age. Well, of course, it's no surprise that this 2009 is showing some age and we've got a gorgeous gold color. I mean, it's just a, a stunningly um, beautiful um, gold color. So that's it. I mean, that's pretty much our point, you know, for the appearance. There is no point or no mark 
um, for discussing the bubbles, right? You're not looking, you know, at the stream of bubbles and commenting on them. You can go ahead and note that you see bubbles in other observations, but when it comes to scoring your wine, there's zero marks and zero points available um, for no for just mentioning bubbles. But I mean, of course, you can go ahead and add it to your note, um, but zero points there. So we head right off to the nose. And when I talk about the nose, um, Jamaro, please jump in with your beautifully eloquent speak when you when you talk about the aromas um, that you get. I'll start us off, but then really look forward um, to you jumping in here. Um, I, I like to, yeah, actually, let me tell you a couple of the scriptures that jumped in my mind uh, earlier when I tasted one and now that I refresh my memory. Um, first of all, you mentioned it's a 2009 vintage, and uh, can we say it's a dosaggio zero? A padose because it's not an everyday. Yes. It's not an everyday drinking and having an 11 plus years old wine. It's really, it's really incredible. But when I first approached, you know, my nose and I was trying to consider the the, the primary aromas and the evolution of the wine, immediately I had that perception of that brioche with apricot jam I was eating for breakfast in my youth at the corner cafe of my of my high school. Um, so that was a sort of an epiphany, a Madeleine I had. And then, of course, the age uh, uh, changes the perception, at least the age or, or the, the fragrance and the intensity of the descriptor. So that, that laurel note is a bit more evident and the grapefruit is a bit more gentle. The acacia is coming out and then the little toasted corn and walnuts. It's really uh, a charming nose because with, by the way, very small and fine bubbles. I really like this color. Um, so those are the, the, the descriptor that came to my mind first. Lily. No, that's, that's beautiful. So, so the first thing, let's go let's get our points right for our, for our nose. The points lie, anybody out there remember how many points you get on the nose? How many total points for the nose section? It's actually seven. Seven points for the nose section, one for the intensity of the aromas, five marks are available for aromas, and one mark for the development, the aroma development. Um, so let's go ahead and do the intensity. You go ahead and you want to put your nose um, to the glass. If you're able to smell everything and fully describe the wine without actively sniffing, you're going to call it pronounced. I go ahead and I put my nose in here. And it's not a pronounced, you know, like say like a, a Riesling or a, um, you know, a very um, aromatic um, um, grape variety wine. I go ahead and I swirl, I smell, and I'm um, definitely in the medium camp. Once I'm in the medium camp, I then have to open it up and say, okay, am I medium minus? Do I stay at medium or do I bump it up to medium plus? So in that realm, once I smell this wine so much, once I go ahead and actively sniff, there is so much here, as Jamario um, noted, where, where I have to bump it up to medium plus. And it's everything from there's some beautiful red apple, the fresh primary here still, but then there's a lovely sort of dried apple component adding beautiful complexity. You know, there's this dried, just beautiful... Well, there's fresh blossom, you know, as Jamario mentioned, you know, acacia. If you've heard me do a note before, you know that, you know, I know that people are from different countries here. We saw you from all over, from Hungary and Italy and France, um, different flora and fauna. If you smell white flowers, but you're not quite sure which one, put blossom. Blossom will get you, you know, that point. But there's a beautiful floral aspect um, to this wine. Catherine, sorry, yeah. can, I, can I reveal a little secret? Uh, just be, just between me and you, okay? Um, <laughs> uh, we're going to talk a bit more later, but I want to give a preview on something. You mentioned floral notes, and you were talking about intensity. Okay. We have a beautiful map to show to our guests, but um, I'm going to show you something. When we talk about uh, the the floral importance of, of, a, of a Francia Corte, at least, you see this map? This, this is a bit artisanal. We have a better one to show you, okay? But the reddish note, the reddish color, correspond to the area where the floral note is more evident and typical, which is on the east portion of the district. 
when we talk about the intensity, the power of the of the fragrances of our bouquet, it's more typical on the orange section, which are also typical of the eastern portion. So we're going to see why, but it's interesting to connect the dots and also do a little bit of after work, turn the, the, the bottle, check the label, where the winery is located, where the vineyards are located, where the fruit come from, and try to understand also the the background of the wine and why that note is more evident than another one. I love it. Where where can where can guests find uh, this map, Jamaria? Um, well, for sure you can go to franciacorta.net and et, and you can um, go in the English section and also download this map and others. There is a HD map, and uh, we're going to provide to the academy to our wonderful partner all the educational uh, material we have, so you can also refer to to Catherine to have exclusive material maybe you don't find normally to the website of franciacorta.net. Great, beautiful. So you can hold us to that. All right, great. So when we talked about the intensity, we have that medium plus intensity here. We're seeing, you know, some dried fruit character. So we're seeing some tertiary here, right? We're seeing a nuttiness. There's some beautiful marzipan. So we have tertiary here. Remember, when you think of aromas, you have to think in terms of primary, secondary, and tertiary. And so we still, I mean, I can't believe with this 2009, I'm still getting some primary, you know, that I can note. That beautiful yeah. apple, that rich pear, you know, but then that beautiful. There is a, a little bit of, of secondary. Here. Well, there's a lot of secondary because secondary also includes our um, yeast autolysis, right? Our, our bread, our yeasty. And there's a beautiful sort of toasted brioche, you know, here. But there's also a little bit of sort of toast um, maybe, Jamario, do you have a, um, any, a little bit of um, oak influence here? Yes, it's partially aged, uh, sorry, fermented in barrique and is really mild. And I like that because I, look, I usually compare, I'm sorry for my non-ethical sometime or, or, or uh, politically correct comparison, but for me, oak and makeup sometimes work in a parallel way. You can enrich the beauty or you can uh, cover what is the primary beauty, the one coming from the DNA and get a bit vulgar. So here the oak is a small piece of the puzzle uh, and leaves a lot of room to the primary aromas, which after 11 years is a beautiful thing to, to detect from the DNA of the grapes, actually. So mm. Beautiful, it's just so elegant. There's this just beautiful, light, toasty you know, component, so so beautiful. So we've got primary, secondary, and tertiary here. I remember five total marks, but don't ever write just five. You're going to write at least seven. And with this wine, you better be writing 10. Actually, there are not sparkling wines on the level three exam, um, but of course um, you can encounter, Francia Corta has been on the level four exam um, in both theory and it, um, it was in tasting. Um, at least once. I think, um, did we lose uh, uh, the picture of Jamario for a minute? Well, I'll keep going with the tasting. Okay, that's okay. I'll keep going with the tasting. So for the level three, we also have that seventh mark is going to be for the development. And so we want to call the wine youthful if it has just primary and or secondary. So please never forget that youthful also includes secondary. So it's only when you go ahead and have some tertiary that you move it off to developing or even further to fully, you know, developed. Um, however, with this wine, we, we can still go ahead and pick out primary, pick out secondary and what's separate from tertiary. And so we can go ahead and call this wine developing. I mean, at 2009, a vintage 2009, it is still developing. And don't forget, for those of you who are out there who are um, candidates for the level four, there is no, you do not need to comment on the development. It's something that's very tough in any event, because sometimes you can get something like honey in a wine, and it's a tertiary for those of you in level three, it's a tertiary, um, but sometimes you can get a fresh honey. And so it can be confusing, um, you know, that it's just, you know, noted in the um, tertiary and not the primary. So I think um, 
that has been done away with um, in the level four. So just keep that in mind. Now, I just want to also mention that you know, we skipped over, right? We went um, in the appearance, you know, we, we've gone through just the intensity, the color. We didn't talk about the look of the bubbles. There's no mark for that for the level three or the level four. So many things can play around with that. A dirty glass, something. Well, hello, everyone. Looks like we had a little bit of a, a technical issue here with uh, with Skype. So I'm going to try to get my two hosts uh, back. One moment, please. And sorry for the uh, the interruption. But it looks like um, we lost connection with uh, with Skype. So let me uh, add those two great presenters back. Okay. Well, here you are. So sorry. Can you see me? Can you see me? Absolutely, we could see you. Yeah, oh, we have, you, we have you all back. I did, I did pay the bills. I did pay the bills. <laughs> <laughs> so, A little uh, excited, like never heard anybody. Exactly. So um, I will hand you back over to uh, to Catherine and and. Uh, Great, thank you so much. So I'll just say again quickly, just in case you didn't hear me, the appearance of bubbles is not important. We're gonna talk about the mousse, the texture of the mousse when it comes to the level three. Um, but you know, again, appearance, nose, those things, we're not um, noting the bubbles at all. Um, you, like I said, with the level three, you could mention it as an other observation, but there's zero points related to it. So now we've gone through the appearance, we've gone through the um, nose, and now we're going to move off to the palate. So we're going to talk about sweetness, of course. And when you look at that sweetness scale, we have to talk about whether the wine is dry, off dry, medium dry, medium sweet, or sweet. Now don't forget, you're using the same scale that you do um, you know, with other wines, with, with still wines. Sweet is going to be your, like your soft turn or your tokai. Right. Medium dry and medium sweet. The wines are going to, you know, perceptively you're going to have as a characteristic of the wine sweetness. Like it, you would it would be bad if you didn't mention that there was a sweet characteristic to the wine. However, it's not sweet enough to be a dessert wine or to pair with a sweet dessert. So medium dry and medium sweet. Um, go ahead and show that there's the characteristic of sweetness in the wine, but not sweet enough to be a dessert wine or to pair with dessert. If that sweetness carries through all the way to the finish, call it medium sweet. If it um, stops before the finish, you'll call it medium dry. Is it on the drier end or on the sweeter end is sort of what you're, what you're looking at here. And of course, off dry is just, wait a minute, am I detecting that something's, a, you know, there's a little bit of sweetness here. You've been just detecting it. It's not just a clever name, off dry. And then of course dry um, is your, it, you perceive the wine as dry. None of this, it's not for you to know the grams per liter and then to relate that grams per liter to it. It's your perception of the sweetness level. So keep that in mind, it's your perception. And so for this wine, for our 2009, the perception is dry. And of course, um, Jamario, as you may have heard, you know, this is a, a zero dosage wine. Of course, he'll say it beautifully, elegant, elegantly. Is it dosaggio zero? Dosaggio zero, you passed the test, yes. It's, uh, it's a wine that, of course, after the degorgement uh, doesn't have any sugar in, in the liqueur de l'expedition, it's just a base wine. And uh, we will skip on the sugar gram per liter, uh, according to the WSA standard. But I want to say something that you probably have, all of you know, um, the, the part of the tongue that has the perception of sweetness is the tip of your tongue. So in doubt, pay literal attention to your, to your uh, taste buds because you have a sour, salty, and bitter on the side and at the bottom of the tongue where the tip right here is the one you can stimulate with an extra taste and detect the sweetness level as perception. 
Thank you, Jamario. So I, I do detect, um, you know, sweetness when I detect it, you know, on the tip of my tongue. So for anybody who has trouble with that, just go ahead and taste one of the soft turns or the tokai and see where it hits you, you know, on your palate um, so that you can, um, you know, gain that that perception on your your own palate. So we're going to head, go ahead and call this a dry um, wine. When it comes to acidity, remember the only it's almost like putting on an acid hat. You only want to think about, you know, if you're salivating and how long you're salivating after you expectorate, right after you spit. It's not where you feel it on your mouth. It's not only concentrate on your um, salivation, which I know doesn't sound good, but <laughs> it works, believe me. So you wanna go ahead and it's it's terrible to do because we think of sipping this, you know, beautiful, you know, sparkling wine um, slowly, but you need to take a big old mouthful of the wine, swish it around like mouthwash, go ahead and spit, expectorate, and then you want to see, are you pooling, you're right? Are you salivating? And do you keep salivating? You can use a count off system for how many seconds, you know, generally for me, it's, you know, Mississippi's, you know, one Mississippi, you know, two Mississippi, you know, if I hit three, you know, it's a medium acidity. If it goes past that, it's four. If it keeps going, it's five. And if I hit that over four, then I'm high. And so this wine, not surprisingly, we're talking about these beautiful sparkling wines with those cooling influences, you know, from those alpine influences, as well as the Lake Zeo that moderates the climate. We've got beautiful conditions for sparkling wine and maintaining acidity uh, in these grapes. So we've got this high acidity here. So again, just concentrate on, on your on salivating. Um, tannin, we don't talk about, um, even with a rosé wine, because we've got this beautiful rosé um, um, that we'll, you know, be showing you. In fact, well, I'll just... Sorry, talk. Catherine, yeah. uh, the more you say salivation and acidity, uh, the more comes an idea of food pairing in my mind. So when it's time to talk about it, I want to give a hint of the idea of pairing some food of this wine. I love it. Beautiful. Let's, let's talk about that. You know, we um now that I'm just happy to be showing, you know, this rosé, which also has, you know, incredible acidity here. Um, let me just do a, a quick diversion about this, this color, this beautiful color of this wine, because at the level three, you've got choices of pink, salmon, and orange, right? Orange is going to be very rare. Salmon is going to have a hint of orange in it. And this has a hint of orange instead of being just pink. Um, and so this is a beautiful salmon color. Those of you who are in level four, of course, the SAT is a little bit different and they've changed the name of salmon to pink orange, as you can see here on the diploma chart. So it's called pink orange. And this would be a beautiful um, um, pink orange since we just talked about the rosé. Okay, but back to the palate, you know, for, for our other wine, we're not going to talk about tannin. Even on the rosé, we're not going to talk about the tannin level. There's no points for it. When we go ahead and talk about alcohol, generally we're talking about medium alcohol for these um, sparkling wines. The body of the wine, this is, this is something, you know, here... A lot of um, sparkling wines can be medium minus, even light, you know, intensity. But there's a beauty, and I want Jamario in a minute to just talk about this because the body in these wines, I mean, this vintage, you know, it has this increased concentration, of course, from age, but it almost has a medium plus body to it. You're talking about the weight, you know, that it sits yeah. on your palate, right? So this beautiful weight, and even, you know, the satin, which is this, you know, beautiful silky wine. Um, in fact, why don't you talk about body, Jamario, for a minute, these wines, this beautiful body that these wines, that these sparkling wines have, and then maybe talk about satin, why you would expect, you know, yeah. sort of silky, beautiful body in that, that um, style category. Well, two things about the body, um, which brings to the structure of the wine. Uh, Pinot Noir, which is a minimum 35% on a rosé, and is also, by the way, uh, about 50% of the dosage of there and the one we're drinking. Uh, in case of Pinot Noir growing from a morainic soil, it translates in the resulting wine as a fuller body aspect. 
So there is not only the possible extension on skin contact to extract more, more fragrances and color and so forth, but it's actually what Mother Nature gives you. Uh, a soil with with uh, the drainage that we characterize by the, the morainic soil, extra mineral content is mineral over mineral because when the glacier arrived from north and arrived to the what is today the Lake of Iseo split in two parts, add to a layer of, of mineral soil already existing around 10,000 years ago, an additional layer of minerals that is resulting in the wine as a bigger body perception. And also, this is, I think, a very key point for a food pairing. Um, when you were talking about succulents, I was thinking, okay, sorry, salivation, succulents, uh, you know, to, to harmonize the, the pairing, a beef carpaccio with a bean salad for the dosaggio zero would be a great idea. Uh, we don't want to open a French Accord to celebrate something or to have with appetizer. Think broadly. I rediscovered a few years ago the pleasure of dining with sherry all the way through, from Fino to Palo Cortado. So it, the same thing with the Francia Corta, rediscover the pairing. And as I like to say in love, of course, yin and yang, beta and alpha can work, but harmony is the key for a long-term relation. In the same case for wine and food, if you talk to a chef, food is the most important. You talk to the sommelier, wine must prevail. I believe in harmony. So that balance is key for the for the pairing. Satin, talking about satin, and I want to show you also. But I'm not going to show you the color. I like you do this actually. I'm going to tell you a brief story about satin because it's peculiar to Francia Corta. Satin uh, in the early 90s uh, happened a very important analogical zonation of Francia Corta. It is sort of the birth. And, and the legislation system of these wines, okay? But um, the point of Satin is that a panel of taster, journalists, winemakers, they all got together over the excitement of this new style that was particularly smooth and creamy to identify the true uh, identity of Satin. Of course, they were 84 samples. Then they decoded the, the Satin, and they came out with this word, by the way, which is a combination of uh, satinato, which is frosted, and silk, which is seta, uh, just because it's an evocative word, also a very musical, perfectly Italian style, um, <laughs> to, to explain uh, what is a tactile, uh, a very tactile way of drinking, a creaminess, a softness, and that's the key point, because satin, instead of the other French Accord, between five and six atmosphere, is below five atmosphere. So, lower bottle pressure, slower bottle fermentation, blanc de blanc only, Chardonnay and Pinot Bianco up to 50%, no herba mat on the scene. So all together gave the birth to this uh, silky, sexy, charming, easy to please uh, uh, way of drinking. And last but not least, satin can only be brewed uh, as, as a typology of wine, which opens the door to a white food pairing. Since I say food, I think about food and go away from the usual parmigiano, reggiano, crado panano, prosciutto, no. Embrace blue grilled bluefish, baked pasta, you know, embrace something more with character because we have a wine with character. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love it. And you're making me hungry and I had lunch. Uh, no, <laughs> beautifully, beautifully said, um, Jamario. I think, you know, just you heard him mention many different food items. Um, Francia Corda, you, because of all the different styles, I mean, you can take, you know, you can have just Francia Corda throughout a whole meal even pairing it with the main dish, with meat dishes, when you have something, you know, with the body, you know, like this, this vintage wine with, it has the body, the intensity and the concentration, you know, to match up to, you know, main dishes, um, which is, which is just uh, incredible. But anyway, um, I will continue on with our discussion of the um, SAT. When we talk about, we, we, I mentioned the body of these wines. So this wine happens to have a medium plus body, a beautiful weight, you know, on the tongue. Um, we do have the addition at level three of mousse, and you do need to cover mousse here. So you'll see delicate, creamy, and aggressive are your choices. And here's how you want to differentiate and use each one. Delicate is for something like this wine that we're tasting now, this 2009, that shows some age or maybe lower pressure like with our satin. And when we're saying satin, it's S-A-T-E-N, 
there's an accent there. But the satin is a special style of wine, I think you heard, but it has to be lower pressure, five atmospheric, instead of the usual, what is it, 5.56 um, atmospheric pressure, which is part of the reason why it's so silky, um, as um, Jamar so more eloquently explains. But, um, you know, so we have that, you know, mousse that we do need to talk about. And the delicate is, you know, very fine, very fine and soft, like very fine, soft and elegant, as opposed to something that is, you know, the aggressive is something where like with sometimes with young sparkling wines, you know, or with, with um, you know, some tank fermented wines, there's just this. Uh, they're, they're ex extremely lively in a in a big burst. They sort of explode on your palate, you know, but then it's just like a quick blast and then they're gone. That's not considered as fine, as, as high quality as something that is a little more fine or soft. Creamy, it describes many, you know, it's probably the majority of sparkling wines have a creamy mousse. And that's like, there's enough liveliness there, right? It provides enough liveliness on the tongue, but it's not that frothy aggressiveness so consider it sort of you know in the middle there um you know the beautiful just it's just the goldilocks just right um so this for this wine we've got this beautiful age on it it's showing that fine soft beautiful um mousse now level four for you diploma candidates out there you are not um talking about the mousse per se you don't have that category in your in the SAT as you can see here where you can note it if you want is only about the texture so when you see here the the flavors right you have marks for flavors primary secondary and tertiary um, at the diploma level and there's four marks available for flavors at the diploma level but you could either well first of all you could have just four flavors mentioned descriptors or or you could have three flavor descriptors mentioned and then include an other observation. And that other observation would be about the texture, you know, of the wine, especially when we're talking about sparkling. That's usually, you know, what it will add to a wine is texture. So um, pedience, you would ignore that that has nothing you're not saying that this has you know bubbles this petience is just for still wines only like with a vinho verde if you happen to notice you know the um some dissolved co2 spritz so that is not used at all for sparkling wines so if you feel like the texture you know is um something of note in your sparkling wine at the diploma level this is where you would note it on something about the texture you know of those bubbles are they fine are they aggressive um so you would note that there but only if it adds is something that you need to speak of i would always still go ahead and do at least four flavor descriptors and then still if you have something of note to say about the texture that is particularly creamy or um you know frothy or such then add that um on so that's where you're talking about that and then i'll be talking about this later but the only other place that you're going to mention your your mousse and that texture again is when you're talking about the quality and so we'll talk about that in a minute so again there's is mousse that you need to comment on at the level three, and these are beautifully fine um, bubbles. This is a beautiful fine mousse. Flavor intensity matches that nose intensity. We've got this medium plus. We mentioned, you know, the aromas pretty much, the flavors match the aromas. We've got that beautiful, you know, well, who remembers how many points are available for flavors at the level three? Anyone? Is it five, four, three? Okay, it's three. So there's three full marks available for flavors at the level three. And, and for a wine like this, you'd have to have at least one in the primary category, at least one in the secondary category, and at least one in the tertiary, because all those three types exist in the wine. So that means that if you forget to add a tertiary, you just noticed you just put sort of red apple and pear and you noticed sort of brioche 
um, you could not get full marks. You have to have a tertiary here because there is beautiful dried apple, you know, that marzipan. There's so many. There's a list of like 10 things you could list off, you know, that are available here. Okay, so that's for our flavors. Um, and of course, you know, again, at the level four, um, you know, if you want in other observations, you can talk about that beautiful um, texture. The finish here is just is long, is long for this wine. In fact, I think for all three of these wines, when we talk about them, you've got this beautiful, just long lingering flavors. Um, that go, you know, they mentioned that a beautiful long finish is, you know, a minute or more. No problem, you know, here with that wine at all. Um, I'm going to pause before I just talk about quality for a little bit. In our last, you know, sort of my last um, few minutes, I'm just going to um, give a brief few comments about quality get, um, in general and how we do it with the SAT, um, but sort of bring you know, um, Jamario sort of back in, you know, talk about the, you know, you know, anything you want to talk about with sort of the quality of the region. Uh, the Chanto School of my daughter. No, I'm joking. Um, they, well, I want to want to say uh, to the scriptor that, you know, while you were talking, I was trying to reach back because I think uh, the describing wine is is a beautiful uh, way of, of communicating because you share mem you share what is in the glass is a scientific approach absolutely but you also you share your memories and when I found in the satin the tangerine peel uh, the the um, the peach blossom you know the daffodils uh, I found the memories of 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 my personal life but there is an, an objective component and a subjective component what we need to agree is not necessarily the term daffodil is the idea of a ripe flower, of a very yellow flower that indicates the ripeness of the fruit and what goes with it because it's a creamy texture and, and so forth. So uh, I think it's a beautiful exercise to taste together, to get together online these days. And also a brief mention of the rosé, which, you know, it's an expected beauty to me. Uh, I'm always skeptical on the rosé because it's very popular right now, but then, you know, I, you, he wins over me right now. And uh, I found that, again, this brioche with apricot jam inside, wild cherry, apple skin, wild strawberries, you know, it's a beautiful harmony. And again, to use another metaphor, uh, sometimes a solo instrument uh, is giving us a sweet melody, uh, but when you have a, a harmony of a chorus all together, of an orchestra, or with different, like this is what happened with different descriptors or different category you know, from ethereal to evolution to primary romance and so forth, we have an orchestra of different instruments that all together play a, a beautiful and charming melody. And this is what happened in the best wines, French Accord, but any other wines out there, really. Um, I, I want to close with one number. And then Amir, if you have another question, of course, I want to close the conversation with you. 15.7. I'm a little, uh, I don't want to use to say the word dork, but I'm a, I'm a very passionate on, on, on history. I majored in history, history and politics back in Italy um, at the university. And uh, I teach at the Renaissance Department of UCLA, and, and, and they have a lot of lectures about these topics. And when I read that Jerome Lomo uh, Conforti in 1570 commented over the mordacious wine of Franciacorta, uh, referring to the already widespread habit of drinking sparkling wine, it gives you the perspective of the kind of made in Italy we're talking about, a wine that has the, the roots in tradition, in deep tradition, from the, from the Renaissance period already. So last aspect I want to mention, speaking about history, culture, human effect is the made in Italy. When you drink Franciacorta, it's not rhetoric rhetorical to say you drink made in Italy. And I do believe that when you drink for champagne, you have that French texture. When you drink cava, you have the Spanish twist. And when you drink French Accorta, you have the Italian element. I love it. I love it. You speak so beautifully, Javario. Thank you so much. Great. So I'll just um, finish up with a little bit about the um, conclusions of these two wines um, before we open up um, for a few questions. So when we talk about the level three and the level four, we are using um, Blick to um, formulate our quality level. So let's talk about the level three. We're looking at Blick, which is balance, length, intensity, and complexity. 
So we have to look at each of those things. Balance is a balance between any, the concentration, that fruit or any sweetness and the other components in the wine, whether it's, it's the acidity, the tan and the alcohol. So it's the balance between those things, especially, you know, um, even at the diploma level, you're really looking at it when it comes to sparkling wines, of course, you're looking at, you know, the acidity versus the sweetness is going to be a big one um, to comment on. Um, but with um, back to the blick, the length, you want it to have that long, like our, you know, that minute that it goes on, um, you know, is, is just this long length. In intensity, we want it to be at the ends of the scale, medium plus or pronounced, you know, will give us the intensity mark towards the blick. And complexity, you know, we want, of course, if you have primary, secondary, and tertiary aromas and flavors, um, you know, you're going to be probably in the complexity realm. And so we have complexity here for sure. So we have all four, which is going to make um, the wine outstanding. Because pretty much, remember, when it comes to level three, you're not going to get a faulty or a poor wine in the exam. So you, if you have all four things in Blick, you're going to have an outstanding wine. If you have three of the four, then you'll have a very good wine. Two of those things, good. One of those things, acceptable um, wine. So that's how they do it using the Blick system. Now with diploma, Blick is just your jumping off point. You will use the Blick system, but then you need to explain each and every one, right? Balance, what is balanced? You can't just say the acidity is balanced by the fruit. You need to get into it. So you need to talk about the. You might be talking about the, um, you know, the autolytic character, right? Beautiful, rich autolytic character. You know, is balanced by the vibrant acidity. If you don't have to mention medium plus or high acidity, use other words for it. Go ahead and be eloquent, like Jamario. Um, you can use here in that conclusion, that quality conclusion, other terms. Um, so how something balances um, between two things, explaining it. Um, and then of course, when it comes to um, your um, further, um, if you don't mind Christian going back to the level three, we do have to comment as well as the quality, we have to um, comment on the level of readiness for drinking. We generally don't use the too young and the too old. It's whether can you, know, can you drink it now, but it has the potential for aging, or is it just drink now, it's not suitable for aging, or drink now, not suitable for further aging because you notice it's had some aging on it. You have to ask yourself two questions, and it's the same two questions that you ask yourself to do it on the diploma SAT chart. One, is there something structural about the wine that will allow it to age, right? So your acidity, you know, of course, tannin in a red wine, um, but acidity here, right? We've got this high acidity from this 2009. And in fact, the acidity, we haven't mentioned much, but we have the second wine here, which is a pale lemon color, but it's a 214 vintage. I mean, this is an incredibly youthful looking wine with some beautiful complexity and tertiary on the nose, um, but it's 214, which is pretty incredible. But anyway, wines like these, you ask yourself, does it have something structurally that will allow it to age? Yes, the acidity, but it can't just be that, or then we'd be telling people to go age a $10 you know, Pinot Grigio from the Veneto, right? So it also has to be, is this something that will get better, get more interesting with age, gain tertiary and become more interesting so that it's worth it for you to recommend that it be cellared because it's going to get better. And so remarkably, I even wrote down that this 2009 vintage, certainly the 214 vintage, and even the rosé here is incredible. Each of these has the acidity and can take on some even additional complexity and tertiary, making it would be really fun. Can we do this again in three years, Jamario? <laughs> Let's do that next year. <laughs> These wines would age, age beautifully. <laughs> Now, in addition, one last thing for me, I know you want to hear a little bit more from Jamario before we sign off, um, but when we talk about diploma, there's also other things to consider, right? You may be asked about the um, method of production when it comes to the sparkling wine. They want to know something like tank or traditional method. 
They don't want you to say something like it has the typicity of, you know, champagne or franciacorta, you know, or cava or, you know, whatever. They don't want you to say that. So you want to be answering, you know, your tank or your traditional, and you're going to have to defend it. So you're going to have to say why. And of course, the, one of the main things you're looking for, one of the easies, is autolytic character that you don't find, um, you know, in the tank tank method. So the rich autolytic character, you know, points to a bottle fermented wine is something that you might want to say to defend um, your choice. You may also be asked to go ahead and talk about the style within the category. And so I just want to clear this up here, you know, that when we're talking about a category, the category is like Francia Corta, champagne, cava. That's what the category is. And the style within the category is not anything to do with your varietal composition. So it's not blanc de blanc. It's not a style. Even though we call it like that in the industry, for the WSET and for diploma, you don't want to say a blanc de blanc or a sweetness level. For whatever country, whatever wine it is, you're not saying it's a brute style or it's a that's not what they're looking to hear right so they want to hear things like is it a vintage is it a non-vintage is it a rosé they want to know those are your styles within a category that they're looking to hear and you'll have to defend those as well so of course if you see a deep concentration of color you, you could say oh you know the deep color and the intense concentration of the primary with also additional tertiary um you know points to a uh, sparkling wine with some extended aging right and such as a vintage and then you'd be defending why you're saying it's a vintage style um within your category Okay, I know I'm geeking out a little bit. Um, and it's I very important the, 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 what you're precising because uh, a, voc a vocabulary is essential for the communication. So the W set is a wonderful way of describing wines and it's important to learn this terminology to make sure that when you talk, you are understood. The communication, the real goal of communication is not on the person talking, it's on the person listening. So yeah. having a common vocabulary, uh, vocabulary is essential and you're doing a great job. No, thank you so much, Jamara. So could you leave us with, you know, some final words on like what you would pair with a vintage, you know, um, with this vintage um, Francia Corta, something you would pair with this this beautiful salmon uh, rosé? I'm going to think a moment out of the box, okay? For for the for the um, the dosaggio zero, I already mentioned the uh, the carpaccio, carpaccio, beef carpaccio with the bean salad, which is very... Uh, refreshing summary we're in california <laughs> and also it goes very well with the acidity the succulence of the meat and so forth um for the rosé uh, i would like to think about some oh, why don't we grill some meat we can grill some sausages some ribs uh also don't forget i i got this fantastic pomegranate scent at some point and i like also to connect like if you cook you use the same wine possibly that you drink with right so if you have this kind of descriptor, try to find in your recipe the idea to cook something together with. So uh, how about, to change completely scenario, a lobster salad with pomegranate seed and, and arugula? Oh, oh how about that? Jamario. I also have a restaurant. This, I stole this recipe from a, a, a chef I adore. I don't love, I adore. I won't mention the restaurant maybe because it's not the case, but um, he came out with a recipe that has medieval origin, by, by the way. Um, going to the satin, which is sort of my weak point lately, uh, I go with what is typical in France and can be enjoyable in California as well, everywhere around the world. Saffron risotto. I like the creaminess of the risotto with the aromatic persistence, the importance of the saffron. Uh, we're talking about something typical of Lombardy, typical of Franciacorta, and also something extremely good to pair with, uh, with a good satin. Uh, and when you see the photos of the tiny flowers opening up with the center, you need to pick with your hands, tiny fingers, not mine, these are too big, okay? <laughs> you also understand why the terrific work behind a big price of a saffron bag. But uh, I, I like to go with that uh, grana uh, and uh, saffron and uh, a buttery risotto for this. 
fried cream or crema fritta when you go for a for a wedding in Italy it's mandatory in your appetizer to see uh, olive alla scolana and fried cream because you have some some little fattiness and oiliness and greasiness and here you have a wonderful acidity to rinse your palate and go for a second bite acidity as you mentioned more than one time is a key point for the wine for the food pairing and for the life of the wine as down so if beginning of a life of wine Oh, you know, Jim, I, and, I, and I look forward to hearing from you again. Um, but let's just, um, if we can, because um, we've gone way over time. Um, yes. We're so thankful. Thank you for all that time. I don't know, Christian, if there's any burning questions we need to answer before we sign off. Yeah, we do actually have a, a question. Um, and but we can is, hear you. Okay. Okay, can you hear me now? Oh, Not yet. So Still can't hear you. Maybe you can okay. pull them up. On you can, the you can probably hear me better now. So uh, we have a question about <laughs> yes. the glasses that um, you have in front of you. Uh, can you talk talk a little bit about the, the special glass? Is it a special shape uh, oh, yes. for French Accord? Uh, these are glasses designed um, specifically for French Accord. You can also see the logo maybe of French Accord right here. Uh, the shape is important because the flute is, is visually nice because you see the, the bubble, the chain of bubbles running up. But what you want is this sort of a tulip shape cut uh, at the very uh, before the edge of this of this glass in order to help the fragrance is coming out. What happens when you smell pomegranate seeds or so for the scriptures? It's not that we have, of course, it is the elements in the wine. These are because they're running up on the surface of the glass, they break and they give us that eminence of something. So the shape of the glass and the quality of the crystal will help the molecules of the wine running up and get into our nose to facilitate the, the tasting. So uh, it's the suggested glass from Francia Corta, designed for Francia Corta. Is it available in the market? Um, that's a good question. I don't think so. But uh, we're going to probably... Uh, put together some Francia Corta quizzes and maybe be able to ship some glasses to someone who deserves it. Uh, that's a good right. idea. I love it. I like that. I like it. Well, thank you both so much uh, for uh, for an awesome education on Francia Corta. Um, you made me thirsty. I think I'm the only one who doesn't have glasses in front of me. So I know I'm going to head to the cellar and pull out a <laughs> bottle over. of of Salten um, for, for this evening. Already looking forward to it. Thanks to everyone who joined us uh, today. If you have any lingering questions, please don't hesitate to put them in the comments section and we will get back to you. Uh, in the meantime, join us again on Monday for our Facebook trivia, 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and then our next study hall next Wednesday, 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, I want to thank both of you so much for uh, all your energy and all the information you shared with our viewers and wish you uh, a safe rest of the week. Thank you, Christian. Christian. Thank you, we have a wonderful podcast together and we're gonna mm -hmm. keep talking about Francois Court and at that time you will be no longer a thirsty man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very much looking Thank forward to that. So. <laughs> <opportunity. Yeah. laughs> Thank you for the wonderful opportunity and, and stay safe and cheer up everybody. Mm -hmm. Cheers. Thanks so much everyone. Ciao. See you on Monday. Ciao. Cheers.